was, uh, my name's John Dennis, um, I'm, uh, I'm head of design at Team 17 and um, for my sins I've, I've been at Team 17 uh, about 14 and a half years. Uh, so my CV is just like, it's just like a collection of words. <laughs> um, but you know, there's worse brands to be associated with. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, you smiling people here today must, uh, must at least have heard of the game and want to come along and kind of hear a bit more about it. Uh, so, who are Team 17? Uh, for those of you uh, who've come to a talk about you know, where, the, where the name came from, uh, and it's nothing to do with there being 17 of us, or us having 17 pounds, or the sadly defunct uh, pop out for East 17. Uh, <laughs> not really sadly defunct, happily defunct, uh, in my opinion. Uh, it's actually born out of a 17 bit software, and at the time, uh, you know, during the Amiga days. Uh, the technology was 16-bit, and so in an incredibly short-sighted move, uh, somebody decided to name the company 17-bit, one bit better, which is great until you get to 32-bit or 64-bit, and suddenly 17-bit sounds a bit short. Uh, so, uh, it got changed to uh, it got changed to Team 17, I think, at, at some point uh, towards the end of the uh, or at some point uh, during the Amiga days. And uh, we're best known for uh, the Worms games, uh, but. Here I've got a, a slide that you can barely see because of the very bright conditions. Uh, so you might have to take my word that it contains lots of other games uh, that we've also made in lots of other genres. And uh, look, you know, we've done uh, Alien Breed there, a top-down shooter, and uh, Project X, a silent shooter. Uh, there's Body Blows, a beat-em-up, and a Super Frog, a platformer, you know, F-17 challenge. So in the early days, uh, Team Sydney actually did things other than games as well, which, was, which must have been exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's talk about um, worms, uh, the early worm here. And uh, it was brought to uh, Team 17 as a, as a demo, which had been coded in Bits Basic. And uh, I, I'm led to believe it was brought as a, it's, it's been done for a competition by a very clever, talented, and attractive young man called Andy Davidson. Um, and uh, he showed it around at uh, ECTS, uh, which is a, a trade show that uh, used to happen in London every year. And uh, we like to believe that really, we were kind of like, I think we were about the last stop on these tour of publishers of the time and uh, I don't think anybody else had wanted it and so, um, you know, maybe he was scraping the bottom of the barrel when, when he signed with Team 17. But we like to believe that we saw something in it, a little bit of X Factor that maybe those other larger publishers didn't see. Um, and clearly, you know, it's a, it's a game uh, a game mechanic that we can see elsewhere, but there's something very, very special about Worms and I think the fact that we're still selling Worms today, um, you know, is a, is a testament to that. Well done, Andy. <laughs> um, so what came next uh, after the initial demo? Well, you, you, you probably already know that, and the answer is um, lots of worms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so here I've got, right, I've got Worms, Worms United, Worms 2, Worms 3D, Worms Blast, Worms Battle Islands, Worms I'm good. And uh, but basically, you know, on every, every platform bar, pocket, pocket calculator and watches, uh, we, we've, pretty, we've pretty much done. In fact, there are so many, I couldn't even fit them all on this slide. Uh, I did another slide with some more, um, and that's, uh, I think, uh, that's Worms United, I think, Worms Reinforcements, Worms War Party, Worms for Mayhem, Worms Forts, uh, Worms Space Oddity, Worms on Xbox, is there any there that people pick up your stuff? Mobile. Mobile, yeah, there's the Worms on Mobile, that's a good call. Any, any others, anyone? No, I've missed off Worms Armageddon for the Eagle Eyed. I didn't include that. But I, I was guessing nobody was going to uh, nobody was going to guess that I missed off the uh, the ZX Spectrum version, <laughs> which, which wasn't a real version. We did this in 1999 as a uh, we did some. You can't, it's a shame you can't really see it. But, uh, um, yeah, we did some screenshot mockups, and that was a, a kind of an April Fool that amused, I think, us and probably nobody else. Uh, <laughs> if I'm honest, uh, and that was followed. Uh, Rather predictably, the year after, by the April Fool Commodore 60 Bell version. <laughs> we're, uh, we're nothing if not predictable. Uh, so you want to know your strengths, don't you? Uh, obviously, these, these weren't real versions of the game. And we also did a mock up of uh, Wormagotchi uh, at the time. Uh, that year, Tamagotchi was, was quite big, and uh, some kind of fanish people got very excited about the non existent toy that we kind of rather maliciously wound up about. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> uh, so you, you're probably thinking, or maybe, maybe you're not, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm leading you like a good presenter to this question. Uh, why so many Worms games, John? Is probably what you're thinking now, uh, now that I've said it. And um, 
Yeah, there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. It's, it's actually quite complicated, and, it, and it's nothing to do with uh, Team 17 being lazy developers. I, I want to. We, we might be, but it's nothing. This is nothing. <laughs> this is nothing to do with that. And we're not lazy developers. We get accused of being rather lazy, and we only want to make one game, and that, and that isn't true. But there's a number of like industry factors that, that mean uh, you know the, the brand has progressed as it has. And, and the first one of those is, um, and probably the least complicated, is the success of the brand. You know, when a game sells many, many, many millions of titles, I mean, I, I think Worms 1 sold in excess of 5 million. The brand is, I, I think it's in the mid-20s, uh, millions of sales. Uh, it's, it's hard to get away from that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, um, that's a pretty big success for quite a small developer. And so that's, the, uh, that's probably the easiest reason to, to understand. The second is the arrival of the PlayStation. Uh, and what happened there was a, was a number of things. And the first was, PlayStation really broke out gaming into a, into, into kind of like a mass market thing. Um, you know, it, it was a box that would go under everyone's television in their living room. And what it delivered was games that, um, at the time, looked like arcade games. I mean, I, I remember seeing Ridge Racer uh, on PlayStation. It just blew me away. It was like the arcade version. It's like, this is fantastic. Um, but the problem, the problem with uh, a console that, um, yeah, where games look very good, it's those very good games. They, they cost a bit more to make. Um, and so to make your money back, you need to sell quite a lot more. And so the cost of the whole enterprise of making a video game suddenly jumped in terms of financial investment and in terms of the financial risk. Um, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment and explain that with a, a much more dull side. Uh, and the third one is the business model. And, uh, and this is the one uh, that I think takes a bit of explaining. And, and so, you know, here comes the science, as they might say, uh, in a bad uh, shampoo advert. Um, so this is, this is the business model that for many years Team 17 have worked with. And um, it, was, it was kind of like the, the primary business model that, that most uh, game developers work with. It's called third party publishing. And so, you know, whenever you bought a game by, uh, let's say, THQ, Codemasters, or um, oh, I'm trying to think of publishers now. Sony, Microsoft. Yeah, well, not Sony, Microsoft, because that's first party. Uh, but third party publishers, um, you know, generally what will happen is this is how it works. You, you have an idea for a game, um, and because the PlayStation and, and consoles thereafter, because of the cost of making games is so high, generally what you, what you need is you need somebody to invest in that game so that you can make it. They need to pay you pay you the money so that you can afford to make it. Um, and so that person is a, is a publisher, or that group of people is a publisher. And so it's a bit like being an author of a book. You know, you write a book, how's that book going to get to, to shelves? You know, how's it, who's going to make the book? Who's going to print it, reproduce it, get all of those books you know, in lorries, taken to shops? You know, who's going to do all of the marketing and organise all of the book signings? And maybe even pop that book when it doesn't sell very well. Uh, yeah, that's your publisher. That's what that's what they do. So, so the way we worked was, um, you know, we'd have an idea for a game, and, and we'd have to take it to someone. And if they if they didn't like the idea, basically that was that was the end of it. Uh, you know, it, it goes no further. So, no matter how original or unique your idea is, uh, if the publisher doesn't like it, it, it doesn't it doesn't get a release in, in the traditional third party business model. And, and you might be surprised to know uh, that um, publishers are interested in games that make lots of money. <laughs> they're most interested in those kind of games. In fact, they're only interested in those kind of games. And so, you know, you, when, you're, when you pitch a kind of an original concept, or you pitch a game that has already sold 10 million, uh, it's, or, you know, or more, it's, it's quite an easy choice for a publisher to choose between them. Uh, and so if they like your idea, and they decide to publish it, you, you basically you both draw up a contract saying when the game will be ready, what it's going to be and how much it's going to cost. And then when you're finished, uh, the publisher recoups their investment that they've made in your development by taking a slice of the profits, which is, which is fair. Um, so, you know, what part of that means that there's only been Worms games? Well, as I've, I've, I've kind of suggested really, it's basically it's whether the publisher likes your idea or not. Um, and whether they think it will make money. They, when you pitch them a concept, they run the idea through something they call a profit and loss account, where they make a prediction about how much it will sell, uh, how much it will sell, how much they have to pay you for it, what their return on investment is, and they do all the maths. Um, so, you know, the consequence of that has been, you know, lots of worms games. That's the first thing to say. But there have been some other kind of like slightly unintended consequences. And um, uh, so the first of these is um, 
other worms concepts that never saw the light of day. Uh, so, uh, you know, here's one here, uh, Worms Battle Rally. And uh, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think anyone, I don't think I've ever talked about this actually outside of Team 17. It's a first, isn't it? It's a first, great, here we go. Uh, it's mildly newsworthy, maybe. Um, and in Worms Battle Rally, uh, it was kind of like a first person shooter, really. You, you, had, uh, you had vehicles here with, um, with turrets and you used the left stick to kind of drive around and the right stick to aim and shoot. Uh, and that got, um, you know, I think we just kind of did a demo of that and we had a working, playable, uh, at least one level, didn't we? I think it was one level. Quite far on, actually. It was quite far on, yeah. But um, we couldn't get the publisher interested in, so um, unfortunately that didn't see the light of day other than here. <laughs> so it's all been worthwhile. <laughs> all of that money spent for this presentation. We're selling, <laughs> Enjoy. We're selling a build of it later. <laughs> yeah, it was, I think we should sell a build of it later. Um, so that's one, Worms, uh, Worms Battle Rally. Worms Collectible Card Game, anyone? Uh, <laughs> that, didn't, that, didn't, uh, that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> it, was really, it was a good idea. It's a good idea. Uh, how about Worms Crawl of Duty? Uh, so, so, um, this is a this is a demo. Again, you can, it's a shame. Xbox it's a, Live, it's, it's got to be. Actually, made this in Unreal Three, uh, so it's, it's quite recent. And, uh, I remember pitching this to a rather bemused Activision executive. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, it was a no. <laughs> but we we like this idea. We did a little we did a little movie, and uh, I thought thought it worked quite well. But, uh, there you go, again, you know, if publishers don't like the idea or they think it's too big a risk or if they think it's too different or for some reason it's not going to sell, then, uh, you know, you don't get to do it. Worms Carts, I think this is the last, uh, I've left this one to last because this, to me, smells a bit at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> I think it's probably the most obvious, you know, uh, obvious thing, you know, what you're doing. And let's do a cart game. Uh, here we go, so there's, uh, there's the mole, uh, who we call Doug, I think. Um, Doug? Mole? Thank you. Uh, Super Frog, and uh, there's, a, there's a worm there, and uh, I, th I think that was kind of... This one, I think, grew out of Worms Battle Rally. We thought, that's right, they didn't like the, the battle vehicle idea. We'll do a cart game, and that's right, we've, we've got some tracks, and we'll just make some cute looking cars, but no, it was still a worm, so uh, that, that didn't see the, the light of day either. Uh, and the other side effect of that is, um, is Worms in 3D. So, um, I've got a little video here of, um, from Ultimate Mayhem, which uh, we, we released recently on Steam, XBLA, and it's coming to PSN, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, another fantastic Team 70 production, if I were to give you the sell, fantastic value for money, great entertainment, etc, etc. All the money? Okay. Um, and so, during the 1990s and the 2000s, um, publishers, um, they had a great deal of success with the advent of um, PlayStation 1. They had a great deal of success with, with kind of like pretty much the first generation of 3D games. Um, you know, games like Tomb Raider, uh, Resident Evil, games that were very big, very glossy, um, and, and they used the power of the PlayStation. And, and we had a lot of trouble convincing publishers at that time that a 2D game was, was a good game even, uh, that it could sell, that um, people wanted to play it. And so, um, you know, we had to sit down and, you know, kind of scratch our heads and say, well, where are we going to go with this? And, and kind of pretty much the answer was, I don't know, let's do Worms in 3D. Um, and, that's, and that's where it was. Are there, are there any fans of Worms 3D here? No. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the 3D game, I think, who was it who showed it? Just down there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such vocal input. Well, I think, my rebuttal to you is I think the one 3D games are rather good. They're not the same as the two, 2D games, they're just something a bit different. And, uh, yeah, they kind of, uh, they, they annoyed a lot of our 2D gamers, I think, maybe you, so I suspect they annoyed you. Um, but they, they annoyed a lot of our 2D gamers when we, when we brought them out because I think people thought we'd kind of abandoned 2D and um, yeah, and that we were never going to make a Worms 2D game again, and that, that wasn't the case. It's just the, the problem was we couldn't get one signed. We couldn't get it on console, and so there was no version of 2D Worms on, on PlayStation 2. None of the publishers were interested. They wanted games that pushed the technical limitations of, of the platform, and they wanted games that looked like other games that had sold. 
Uh, yeah, and, and to be fair to those people who review and should I really bring them something very, very different? It's very hard for them to say, oh yeah, we'll take a chance on this. You know, if you've got something that's very much like Tomb Raider, and Tomb Raider sold, you know, millions, you think, well, yeah, you know, maybe this, even if this sells half of what Tomb Raider does, that's quite good. So, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's very difficult at that time. And so the 2D, uh, the 2D game could move to handheld and mobile. Um, and this is uh, some footage from um, Worms Open Warfare 2. I think it's the advert from Worms Open Warfare 2. So we forged a bit of a partnership with, um, with THQ uh, and we released Worms Open Warfare and Worms Open Warfare 2 on PSP and DS and, and they were both uh, very, very successful. And I think the second one in particular, Worms Open Warfare 2, is actually it's a really, really good version of uh, Worms 2D. Uh, and the DS version was, a, was an excellent version as well, and had lots of DS mini games and specific functionality. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of where the um, where the 2D game hit out there and on, on mobile, you know, like Java phones, uh, where we partnered with the AE to do that. Uh, and, and I suspect that's um, that's that's the way it would have stayed um, had had kind of not the seismic shift to digital happened uh, in the last few years. And, and, and kind of, we all saw it coming, I think. Um, and the first area it really affected was music, where people thought, I, d I don't really want a CD anymore. Uh, I, don't, I don't need that. I, I just want, I just want to be able to carry my music around with me. And these, uh, you know, this, this clever device here, I can, I can have, you know, hundreds of albums on, on one device and have them all at the, a click of a finger. And so I think everybody saw the demise of box product in, in music. And they saw it coming to games, but it took. A, I think it took a little longer than we. And it's still, it's still happening. It's, it's happening very, very slowly. Yeah, you know, retail at the moment's kind of been propped up by um, pre-owned, and there's probably maybe ten or twenty big titles every year. You know, your Call of Duties, Assassin's Creed. You know, your really big titles that really do good numbers at retail. But there's very, very few of those games now, and retail's a very hard place uh, to sell games uh, because of the move to digital. Uh, and they're competing with services like Xbox Live Arcade, Steam, and PlayStation Network. Uh, and you know, and you can get those games. You see them on your dash. You fancy it. You download it and you play it. Uh, you don't have to go to a shop. You don't have to buy anything. You don't, you know, you don't have to plan that purchase. It can be, uh, it can be an impulse purchase. And what's more, once you've bought it, you can download DLC for it, and there's further content if that's, you know, if you liked it a lot. Um, so it's just like, it's brilliant for developers because it means there's not a massive overhead in terms of box product. You, you can do it without a publisher. Uh, and it's brilliant for gamers because I think at the minute we're all spoiled with probably more games than I, you know, a bigger choice of games than I ever remember there being at any time. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. Uh, so it's a brilliant time, you know, really creative time. And that's all been, it's all been brought about by digital. And so, you know, when we saw it, uh, we kind of took our first tentative step with um, Worms and, and actually um, we weren't really sure about the move to digital and we were working with THQ at the time and, and we offered Worms uh, for, for Xbox Live Arcade to, to THQ and, which was silly in retrospect um, and they turned it down which was even sillier uh, so we, did it, we ended up doing it ourselves and it's the second highest selling game on Xbox Live Arcade um, wow, <laughs> you know, and, and so for us, you know, it was um, uh, it was really gratifying to find out that you know we, we took a chance ourselves and we published it ourselves. It was really gratifying to find out there were so many people who still wanted to play our two D game uh, on a, on a console, you know, on a console like the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, which is like incredibly powerful. It was so nice that, that people really appreciated the gamers really appreciated the quality of, of what we made. And so, um, here we go, predictably, we followed it with um, Worms 2 Armageddon. And Worms 2 Armageddon, um, it was about 18 months later. I think that stood in the top 10 of the highest rated games on, on Xbox Live Arcade. So, again, you know, it's, it's very gratifying that not only have people voted with their wallets, but they've also, also voted in, in recognising the, the quality of the game. So it's been, uh, it's been really nice. And we followed that, we, we actually took a chance, we followed that with, um, with three games uh, Alien Grid, uh, a trilogy of Alien Grid. Is anybody who's played them and, and liked them? Great, most of the fans. <laughs> I was afraid to get another no there. <laughs> 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 um, so, you know, we, we, we took, again, we took a bit of a chance. We thought, you know, 
um, we're going to pile, you know, we're going to invest in, in uh, something different, we're going to do something a bit new, and we don't need a publisher to do it. And so we made, uh, you know, we made three Alien Brew games and they came on uh, XBLA, PSN, and Steam. And they're doing all right. I think they're, they're pretty good games. I think they capture the spirit of the original Alien Brew games. They look a lot nicer. Uh, they sound a lot nicer, but I think they capture something of the, uh, something of the, uh, the flavour of the originals. Uh, we've also branched out as well, so we did uh, Steam, we did uh, Worms Reloaded, which is kind of the, we think, uh, it's a kind of a, a love song to the original Worms again. it's got kind of many of the original graphical themes, and uh, many of the original speech banks, it's kind of like the ultimate expression of the 2D games. We followed that um, this year with Worms Ultimate Mayhem, which was kind of like an ultimate expression of the 3D games, uh, it was a compilation of the two, and we've, we've recently kind of, uh, Done something a little different, which was Worms Crazy Golf. Which, I, if, if anyone's uh, had a look around the hall, you can come and have a play of it. Uh, it's kind of like a bit of a match made in heaven, actually. I don't know why we didn't think of it sooner, but um, yeah, because it revolves around shot power uh, and shot trajectory. So, uh, yeah, check it out. You know, go and, uh, there's, there's Mark and Kelvin here uh, uh, from the stand. You know, go and, go and badger them later and uh, have a go on Worms Golf and see what you think. Not here to sell you anything, though, I just think it's quite a good game. Um, so, that, so that's it really, that's, um, that's where we are at the moment, but I hope, you know, uh, I've given you a little insight into, uh, you know, how the business model and the, and the way we've worked and the way the industry works has, has funneled the brand down a certain path and it's not always been the one we wanted to take and it's not always been the one that we planned. Um, but, you know, we're still in, I suppose, uh, when a lot of other independent developers aren't and we're, we're still making, I think, you know, quite a good game. Uh, for people to enjoy and as long as people keep playing it, I suppose we'll keep playing <coughs> So thanks very much. If anyone's got any questions, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the form is. Put your hand up, I suppose. There's a, there's a guy there. Yeah, feel free. Um, I, we play about three or four times a week on Xbox Live. We have a really bad problem with getting four players yeah, it's, yeah, brilliant. So first question is a bug. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely, you're absolutely right, and I think historically we've had a very bad, uh, we have a very bad record of uh, supporting our touch, particularly with online play. You get like, say, there might be four of us in a party, all friends, two of us will join the game, the other two, join, no games playing, no games playing, no available game, all that, it's been happening since we bought the game. We, 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 do, we do actually have people working on that right now, and, uh, so there, there will be a fix coming in, I can only apologise now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry? They, maybe they're not. Yes, I hope they are, aren't they? They're working right now on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> We're on it now. Yeah, we have top people on it. Top people. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. Um, we talked about anticipating with this and Ramp Fox saying that you bring the Yeah, I think that what we're saying is that if there's some sort of like incredible planning and foresight in our part. <laughs> 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 yes, 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 we were just waiting, we, no, we weren't waiting. Uh, you know, um, the company's uh, maybe 60, 70 guys, and uh, so there's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite expensive to pay 60, 70 guys every month to keep the studio running, and so to keep the studio running, you know, you do have to make the product. And so the digital thing, I think it, it was partly good planning, but it was also partly, uh, like as I say, I, I think that the first one was offered to THQ, and had we known how big digital was going to be, that offer would never have been made, and had THQ known how big it was going to be, they'd have said no. They thought it was too small for them at the time, because it, you know the very genesis of uh, Xbox Live Arcade, it was kind of like a lot of old arcade ports, you know, Midway had done Gauntlet, and it was like Gallagher, and uh, you know, a lot of them I thought were a bit, you know, a bit meh. They'd even made them widescreen, you know, there was like, got a picture panel down either side of And I think literally everyone thought it was just like, oh, it was a place for old arcade games. But, uh, you know, we thought, with Alien Breed as well, we thought, actually, you know, we can, we can deliver a AAA experience here, AAA visuals on this, on this um, you know, through this channel. Um, so I think there was, a bit, there was a bit of foresight, but also, you know, quite a bit of luck as well. And it's been good, yeah, we've always fought to keep ownership of our brand. So nobody, you know, many other developers, often they will sell, when, when they make a deal with a publisher, they'll often sell the IP. 
um, and the danger of that as Core did um, you know, with um, IDOS is that you know, if at any point IDOS are unhappy with Core, they take the game elsewhere. And now you know, Tomb Raider's not even made in, in the UK anymore, it's, you know, it's made in the States by Crystal Dynamics, and that's a bit of a shame. So, um, yeah, we've always had the idea. So maybe it was a bit of planning, it was circumstances, I suppose, as well. Get both. Uh, same topic, I you said about when you published Worms, you did it yourselves, and after having shot it around to THQ, why, why didn't you just do that in the first place? Why didn't, why didn't we do it, sorry? Why didn't you just self-publish Worms in the first place on the Because I think we, we were as unsure as THQ were about how big it was going to be and about the numbers. At that time, nobody really knew what the numbers were going to be. You know, the install base for 360 was quite small at that time. Uh, you know, therefore the sales on Xbox Live Arcade were quite small, so we were unsure about you know, how rapidly that platform was going to expand and how, what, the, what the return on the investment was going to be. So, it's, you know, you're always a bit unsure whenever there's a new platform, so for example, Vita that is coming soon, you know, people are always unsure about whether to jump in or not because they don't know, you know, what the game's going to sell for, you know, how popular is it going to be when it comes out, so you're taking a bit of a risk. And, and risk isn't normally a good thing, you know, it can often be a bad thing, so we try and avoid it. Maybe. Would we go outside of the Worms brand and would, would we do something? Would we take another chance? Yeah, in a, in a way, we find ourselves a little in the, in the seat that the publisher was maybe 10 years ago, where you think you look at prospective projects and you look at the return on investment, and it's always very tempting to go for the one that returns the most. And so I think you'll continue to see Worms games from Tim but um, we've we'll got some other things on the go as well. Dennis. Monkey tennis. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have monkey tennis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. I think Partridge has got it. <laughs> I think actually something that did monkey tennis already. Actually. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, moving from demo programming to actually game programming. Was that a big culture shift for people? I don't, at the time, I don't think it was. A, so the question there was about whether it was a culture shift. Because um, we started as kind of doing demos for the Amiga out of a Leeds shop, basically a shop called Microbuy. Uh, whether it was a big culture shock to go to development. At, at that time, no, because that, um, yeah, that, that, that market was very immature and very small. So when, when, when we first started off, uh, team 17 owned a chain of shops called Microbuy, um, and so we, we we were the developer. We made we made the games. We were the publisher. We published them <laughs> with a retailer. <laughs> we like, owned the whole value chain uh, from top to bottom. But um, I don't think it's a massive culture shift. I, th I think it's like you know the industry evolves, and uh, the, you know we've kind of evolved with it. So. That's a very present question. Um, so we've got a range of <laughs> not yet to sell things. I, I sound so salesy as soon as I start talking about our products. We've, we've actually got a so we've got a plush super sheep. Uh, he kind of like when you squeeze him, he does the little sound. He's very cute. Um, we've got some <laughs> uh, we've got some plush worms coming. We've got some wormware, uh, some t-shirts, and we, we've got um, we have resin figurines coming. <laughs> We've got big posters as well, and so we just you know, we just starting to see um, we just starting to see the first um, we've, we've signed a few deals um, this year with um, kind of toy manufacturers. So you'll you probably if you're eager on it, you'll, you'll see some things arrive in shops. So. Yes, sir. The revenues, in, in, ter in terms of what, what the pack from all the tax. Um, 
Okay, so that question was about revenue splits, and I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say because I no because, <laughs> because I, I think the I think the actual numbers I think the actual numbers for the revenue splits are confidential. You know, when you when you sign with Microsoft or Sony, I think so. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say it, but um, they take uh, a, a fraction. Is that me personally? <laughs> Not, in, not in office, <laughs> not, not, for, not enough for doing this. <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're all pretty much the same actually, all of those digital platforms, but digital, I mean, the, the, the revenue uh, share that the developer gets from a digital development is far, far, far in excess of what you get from a, a box product. So even though your box product might sell for 40 pounds, uh, and your digital type might sell for £1.99, you'll see more money uh, from the £1.99 development than the £40 development. And the reason is because there's no, there's no cost of goods, so you don't have to worry, you know, there's no cost of goods to factor in. Nobody's got to print any CDs or boxes or manuals. You know, there's no logistics, so there's no worrying about, uh, uh, you know, shipping boxes to shops. There's no retail to take a slice. I mean, retail will often take a third. Off that, um, off that price straight off the top. You've got no worry with um, pre-owned. Uh, so none of that pre-owned money, if anyone buys pre-owned goes, none of that money comes back to developers. That's just like, that stays in retail. So you've got none of that either. You've got, you know, if you're self-publishing as well, you haven't got the publisher taking this bit either. So, um, you know, digital has been incredible for developers. And, and it, it's been nice, the benefit to consumers has been that people will take a chance. And you see more games on iPhone now and more different and creative games than I think you could ever have seen at retail. You know, those games just couldn't have made it just because of the risk and because of, you know, all of the associated cost of getting a, a game to, to a shop. So it's, it's a good time. It's good for developers. It's good for consumers. It's, I suppose the only person really bad for is publishers. <laughs> Uh, we use, um, are you a developer? We use something that's a cross between Waterfall and Scrum. It's, it's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little. We need a better name for it, don't we? We need like, it, it's called, yeah, it's, yeah, Water Scrum. Yeah, as good as it. Yeah, that's brilliant, Scrum Fall. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think at the moment, uh, so it's about Project X, but Project X will come back. I, I don't know, and the reason is because it's a very hard market for that, that genre in particular. It's a very hard for a genre. And so, sorry? We could do it for the iPad, but even, even games like, um, you know, like Aruga, which is like really, I, th I think maybe the best kind of side top scroller shooter I've ever played, that didn't do great on digital, and so. That rather puts you off, you know, you think, oh, do we want to, do we, if they can't do it, you know, can, can we do it? And I, I think the problem is a lot of those brands as well, a lot of those old games, they, they cease to have kind of resonance with your audience. I mean, you, you know, you're probably different, but the people here, uh, just by the fact that you are here, you're incredibly hardcore people, you know, uh, whereas, you know, for your casual audience, Project X doesn't mean anything to me, so I don't know. Uh, there's a pre brand. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're going to go, I'll, I want ATR2, thank you very much. ATR2? <laughs> yeah, that's Super Op 2. Super Op 2, don't you worry. Write us a check, we're open to suggestions. <laughs> checks by to, checks by to cash. <laughs> thank you. Um, retail must be fairly terrified about the move to digital. And I'll be honest, I don't, I don't want to see uh, physical products go away. Um, but is there any, are you aware of any pressure in the industry from retail to make, or I call, you know, put pressure on developers to keep making box products? No, I don't think retailers can pressure developers to make box products. Um, yeah, if, it, if it doesn't sell and it doesn't make money, people won't do it. That's the, that's the, that's the bottom line. In the so there's no, there's no pressure like that. I agree with you. I'd like to see game shop in the high street. I think it's good for the industry and it's good for people to have choice. Um, but you know, there's a there's a certain inevitability. People vote with their with their wallets. You know, and if, you know, does anybody here buy CDs still? Okay, <laughs> you're just the wrong audience to ask. <laughs> I should have tweaked that one. It's a retro That's way smaller. I imagine if I would say who listens to music digitally, maybe on an iPod or an MP3 player. 
basically it's like nearly from a CD. It's, it's nearly <laughs> off a CD. It's nearly everyone. And so people people vote with their with their wallets, you know, if they if they want to buy things from iTunes, they buy from iTunes. If they want to buy from HMV, they buy from HMV. So you know, you, you can't really resist the market forces still this way it's kind of thing. I think it's a shame. I would rather see some kind of a better arrangement maybe but you know retail on um, maybe developers best friend no, they, they, with the, the, the pre-owned thing I mean they, they you know whenever I go to buy a game they're like oh well, you can have this for pre-owned you know it's two pounds cheaper it's, like, it's, like, it's so rude isn't it yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they say they put it in the bag and they say don't forget to bring it back and trade it in when you're finished yeah. I won't be doing that um, yeah so they're not really they've not really helped they're not endeared themselves to developers yes sir what are your views on them Love? That's not to like. Yeah, if, they, if they're good games, I, I, you know, I, and there's a lot of games I'm very fond of. Uh, you know, a lot of 2D games I'm very fond of. Like Streets of Rage, I was very happy that PSP, uh, it was possible to play you know, old games on that. So I gave uh, Streets of Rage a bit of a go and have it. It's, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, Group Deluxe, uh, uh, the speedball remake as well, that uh, John Hare, John Hare's company did. It's very nice to see those games. Those games come out. There are actually uh, sales mode uh, on Steam. You can purchase the original Worms, Worms Pinball, and Worms Blast at the moment. I think there's plans for more of our retro titles. For example, ones that have like new graphics, and then go back to the old style graphics. We've got no plans for it. I have to say that we've got no plans for it. There's a question. There was another one here, wasn't there? Free DLC, we're living, we're living. <laughs> we've, we've just done free DLC for Worms Crazy Girl, so. Um, I don't know how to, didn't we? We released a carnival course, uh, which really came out a week later, I think, or a couple of weeks later, so. But, uh, you know, I think DLC is a great thing. I think, uh, you know, back in the days of box, or in the days of box product, you know, it, was, it was a bit like fire and forget. So you, you'd develop your product, you'd release it, and then you know, maybe if you were lucky there would be a patch that you would put on your website for, for people to download and fix all the problems because the game wasn't quite finished. Um, but, no, I don't want to speak anymore about <laughs> that topic. Um, whereas now, I think it's very nice uh, as a gamer, but also as a developer, that if, if people like your game, uh, and they like a particular aspect of it, you can, you can cater for that. So people, if people like the single player, you can make more single player levels. If people like multiplayer, you can offer more multiplayer modes. You know, if people like customising their worms, you can offer more things for them to customise. So I, th I think that's nice. I'm going to stick clear of you because I, I don't want to get caught in some Team 17 shoddy product conversation again. Is there any like further, sir? Oh, sorry, it's not a worms question. Uh, but who owns the IP to Assassin's Creed Origins? Is that owned by Team I suppose. So are we going to see that release? <laughs> We've got no immediate plans. Oh, it's, 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 it's one of the best like, shooters that we need. Well, it's great. It was, it was mostly my work, so it's, uh, it's really great. <laughs> 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 was, it, was it published by Team 17? Yeah, was it, was it, was it um, Tim Woodhouse? Did Tim Woodhouse do a video? Jamie Woodhouse. No, that's Quack. That's Quack. That's Quack. Did he do Quack as well? He did Quack as well, he did, yeah. I think, we've still, I think we've still got a pity, I think that's still ours, is that? Is it? Yeah. He recently did Quack though, didn't he? I think he did Quack yeah. for... Yeah, on iOS, I think. IOS. So, no, yeah. Yeah, so he's still going, which is nice. So, so, there's a lot of questions down here, is there really further back? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, on, on live, uh, so the question there is about, um, yeah, what about on live and, and the streaming games? I think it's really exciting, don't you? It's, um, I was wondering how that would change your way of thinking that actual revenue, because you'll release the games, which costs many people. Well, each of, the, each of those platforms has different revenue models, and I'm not sure what the on live one is. I think you can, it's a split, isn't it? You can pay for a session, or you can pay a subscription, or you can you have it for a limited amount of time. On, 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 
as a developer, it won't be, you know, you get a certain split of whatever, you know, what, whatever's taken, and that split is argued out with the most people online, I guess. I don't really know. We've not we've not jumped into one live yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the market's I think very very fragmented, and it's moving in lots of different directions. And there's uh, you know, like social, for example, is um, it, you know, very different than those those products. And there, I don't know if anyone here plays Facebook games, but you know, many of them aren't even games. A lot of them are toys, uh, you know, that are designed to kind of like chisel you know 25p out of you at a time. <laughs> Sorry, these worms coming out. Yeah, a bit right, I'll do it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, th I think it's interesting, and uh, you know, we, we just you just try and stay abreast of everything and look at the opportunities and take the ones that are most suitable. <coughs> oh, ladies first. It's always been a problem. I think it's always been a problem, you know, whenever we release anything. If you, you know, if you want to go on a time on site, you can pretty much find it the day it comes out, is it? I think it's always been a problem on, uh, you know, you just live with it. It's just in a different form and it's the way it goes. You can't, if people don't, I think, you know, to my mind, if people don't want to pay for your product, they're not going to pay for it. They're not your customer anyway, so. <laughs> Do you, know, like, do you know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't know whether piracy is more or less prevalent now than it, than it has been. Yeah, it's, well, it's not, is it? Um, Gabe, Gabe Newell from Steam, he did a big talk on piracy, saying how it actually doesn't affect digital sales as much as what box retail used to do. So uh, if Steam are worried about it, then I don't think we should be too worried about it. There we go, there's your answer. Thanks, Bob. No. <laughs> Although we did, uh, I think with Alien Breed, uh, initially, uh, the first game, the Aliens had a passing resemblance to the Alien from Aliens. Uh, and so we had a, I think there was a legal discussion with Fox, uh, and we had a letter from Fox saying that we were okay to do what we were doing, and uh, we were okay to, to keep the name as, as the name. But um, no, I, I don't think, uh, but yeah, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and obviously the Holy Hand Grenade, I, mean, I don't think there's ever been any comeback from that. Maybe there will be when they see this. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were just unaware of it. <laughs> so, are we all cool? Oh, there's one there. Uh, what do you think of uh, free-to-play games? What do I think of free-to-play games? So, uh, I think, I think, you know, if people people enjoy the idea of playing something for free uh, and then they're happy to pay as they go along, then I, I think that's brilliant for them. For me, I, I kind of, I want to know what the cost is up front, rather than kind of playing for an hour, getting into the game and then finding out I can't do anything unless I, I pay them 25p. Uh, I don't know if it's a bit. I don't know if it's a bit of a cotton. I don't know. <laughs> but but the the, pro the problem is, you know, the, the problem with those kind of games is, and the, and the problem with like six, 69p games is that it kind of, it, kind of, it makes people think that games are a cheap commodity. Uh, but actually, you know, they're, they're not. There's a lot of work goes into a video game. There's a lot of artistry. There's a lot of technical expertise. There's a lot of experience, and so. Um, you know, if it works for those Facebook games, and I, it's working at the moment for Zynga, but I know Zynga, um, yeah, they've had to change the way they account, they do their numbers to make sure they don't post a loss. Uh, I don't know if we're on the cusp of a change uh, with that business model, so I don't know if, if people want to play those kind of games, and they are good games, I think they're really well designed products, I think they're great, Sim Social looks great. Uh, I've not jumped in, I'm kind of scared to jump in, because I think, you know, how much is this going to take me for? Uh, so, so I've, I've steered clear, but um, yeah, they are great looking games, so I think it's just another, 
it's a, it's a right I punch it. Uh, I just think it's another way for people to purchase and experience games. But I, I, I do think there's a danger of people thinking that games are a cheap commodity, when re really they're not. They're, they're, they're built by people. They require a great deal of expertise, and they are kind of expensive ventures. Okay, so given that we're in the middle of a recession, Everybody here has paid good money to spend time doing the thing that they love. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that you would say to them to make them change their mind that 69p isn't the way to go? I'm not saying 69p isn't the right way to go. I'm saying if you want to buy those games for 69p, buy those games for 69p. I, I think it's okay. And the same as free to play. If people want to play for free, play for free. That's cool. But I, I think that the, you, know, you have to understand that... that you know, I, I think when people play an iPhone game for 69p and then they go on their console and they're playing something and they think, oh, well, that's expensive for, you know, 199 uh, You know, you, you think, well, you know, you've got to understand there's a team of like 50 people have been working a year on this game. There's a lot of cost, you know, behind that. That's all, that's all I'm saying. I'm not suggesting anyone needs to play I'm on your games. side, trust me, I'm on your I'm side. I'm certainly not arguing. But when you go into your kits are looking at 35, 40 quid a game because all the other kids have got it, and the justification is there's an awful lot of time and effort gone into this. That's fine, but that's a food bill for a week. It, it's a product like any other product. It's like you, you could be arguing with me about trainers and saying, you know, trainers should be fine. I agree with you. I've, I've got kids as well. So you, you know, you're just gonna you're just gonna decide what you want. You pay your money, you take your choices. I'm not advocating one or the other. I'm just I'm just saying the danger is that people start to think that games are a cheap commodity and, and it's not easy to make a video game. It's certainly not easy to make a good video game. That's, that's one choice. <laughs> I think that's already happened. Um, so it's a question about are the big boys going to squeeze out the little boys um, from the uh, from the iPhone and the iPad market. And I, I think to some extent that's, that's already happening. You know, uh, EA bought Playfish uh, and Chillingo. So I think you're already seeing that they're buying, you know, they're buying market share. So yeah, I, I think it just happens. You know, as the market grows and the money becomes, you know, the potential revenues become larger. Those those big companies see that it, it pops up on their radar and then they want some of that some of the share. No, because yeah, we have a product here that we own. We own the IP for it, and good people like yourselves uh, want to play want to play that game. And so, you know, as I say, as long as people want to play it, we'll keep making. Okay. Was it, 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 it this gentleman here? Yeah. I would let them apply work. You just approach them and say, "I'm a product, no harm to you to sell it." Don't buy it, don't buy it. So how does Xbox Live work? Okay. No, no. So Xbox Live's um, again. I'm not quite sure what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. But they have. What you do is you, you kind of you submit a concept to them. We we are first party, so they're essentially our publisher. So uh, we talk to them and we say this is a product that we want to do. They assess it. They have a kind of a panel who assess it and they say yes, this fits with our portfolio, or no, it doesn't. Uh, and if it does, you then kind of like discuss about what price point you're going to go at, and they have a view on that, and you have a view on that, and so you, can, you come to an agreement. And that's just, it's, it's really not very complicated. Broadcasting ideas and things that you've already made, you can't sell them to Xbox Live because you've already made it. But obviously, the risk of them is if nobody bought it, all they're doing is giving access to the game for them. Yeah, I, I think though, from their point of view, um, that they want, they want to manage their portfolio. So they want to, they want to guard the quality of the offerings, and they want to limit the number of offerings as well. Because I think the big problem with digital, as is possibly anyone who's tried buying anything on the app store has found, is like it's just like really hard to find anything. You know, even when you know what it, what it looks like or what it's called, even it can be quite hard to, to actually find it. The problem is visibility, and so those, um, you know. Apple are, are totally open, pretty much. They're like, oh, whatever, you know, you know, put stuff on the store, and that's why there's so much on there. Whereas PlayStation uh, and Xbox are a bit more guarded about what they want on their portfolio, and obviously they don't want uh, they don't want to double up things. So if there's a if there's a really good, I don't know, um, you know, motocross game on there, then they don't want another motocross game. Do you know what I mean? So that's that's kind of how it works. So they manage their portfolio, and I think they're right to do that. It's, What's your favourite version of Worms? My favourite version of Worms is probably, I think, what was the one we used to play in the office? Was it Worms 2 or Worms Armageddon? 
Armageddon. to give us Worms Armageddon. It's got to be Armageddon. Worms Armageddon's a great game, yeah. but we used to have a lot of fun there. There was a lot of, we used to sit and play on a LAN, and there was a lot of trash talking. It was very funny, and I'm not very good at the game. Uh, between you and me, nobody else heard that, did they? Uh, I'm not very, I'm not very fond. Were well, you doing that just then? That's right. You were doing that. <laughs> I'm not. I did, when I was at that very good game, we used to have some expert people in our place. They could do like crazy stuff. Um, so I think it's probably worth having again. We've, we've had a lot of fun in the office playing all of the games we've made, but that's the best on the road. Who's the best on the road? I don't want to give anyone any credit because if they ever hear that I've said it, they'll be like, "Do you know what I mean?" We know what you mean. So I can't say. software and at the time, uh, you know, during the Amiga days, uh, the technology was 16-bit and so in an incredibly short-sighted move, uh, somebody decided to name the company 17-bit one bit better, which is great until you get to 32-bit or 64-bit and suddenly 17-bit sounds like uh, so, uh, it got changed to uh, it got changed to Team 17, I think at, at some point uh, towards the end of the uh, or some point uh, uh, so you're probably thinking, or maybe maybe you're not. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm leading you like a good presenter to this question. Uh, why so many worms games, John? Is probably what you're thinking now. Uh, now that I've said it, and um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. It's, it's actually quite complicated, and it's nothing to do with uh, Team Seventeen being lazy developers. I, I want to. We might, we might be, but it's nothing. This is nothing. This is nothing to do with that. And we're not lazy developers. We get accused of being rather lazy, and we only want to make one game, and that, and that isn't true. But there's a number of like kind of industry factors that, that mean uh, you know the, the brand has progressed as it has. And, and the first one of those is, um, and probably the least complicated, is the success of the brand. You know, when a game sells many, many, many millions of titles, I mean, I, I think Worms One sold in excess of five million. The brand is. Uh, I think it's in the mid 20s, uh, millions of sales. Uh, it's, it's hard to get away from that. You know, that's that's a that's um, that's pretty big success for quite a small developer. And so that's the uh, that's probably the easiest reason to, to understand. The second is the arrival of the PlayStation, uh, and what happened there was a was a number of things. And, and the first was PlayStation really broke out gaming into a into, into kind of like a mass market thing. Um, you know, it, it was a box that would go under everyone's television in their living room. And what it delivered was games that, um, at the time, looked like arcade games. I mean, I, I remember seeing Ridge Racer uh, on the PlayStation. It just blew me away. It was like the arcade version. It's like, this is fantastic. Um, but the problem, the problem with uh, a console that, um, yeah, where games look very good is those very good games, they, they cost a bit more to make. Um, and see it. And, uh, you know, so here I've got, right, I've got Worms, Worms United, Worms 2, Worms 3D, Worms Blast, Worms Battle Islands, Worms I'm Good. And uh, but basically, you know, on every, every platform bar, pocket, pocket calculator and watches, uh, we, we, pretty, we pretty much done. In fact, there were so many, I couldn't even fit them all on this slide. Uh, I did another slide with some more. Um, and that's, uh, I think, uh, that's Worms United, I think, Worms Reinforcements. 
Worms will party, worms for mayhem, worms forts, uh, worms space oddity, worms on Xbox. Is there any there that people pick up your stuff? Mobile. Mobile? Yeah, there's the worms on mobile, that's a good call. Any, any others? Anyone? Okay, that's great. No, I've missed off worms Armageddon for the eagle eyed. I didn't include that. But I, I was guessing nobody was going to uh, nobody was going to guess that I'd missed off the, uh, the ZX Spectrum version. <laughs> 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 Which wasn't a real version, we did this in 1999 as a, uh, we did some, it's a shame you can't really see it, but uh, um, yeah, we did some screenshot mock-ups and that was a, a kind of an April Fool that amused, I think, us and probably nobody else, uh, <laughs> if, if I'm honest. Uh, and that was followed uh, rather predictably the year after by the April Fool Commodore 64 version. <laughs> we're, uh, we're nothing if not predictable. Uh, so you want to know your strengths, don't you? Uh, obviously these, these weren't real versions of the game. And we also did a mock-up of uh, Wormagotchi uh, the time, uh, that year. Tamagotchi was, was quite big and uh, some kind of fanish people got very excited about the non-existent toy that we kind of rather maliciously ran the map about. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> so to make your money back you need to sell quite a lot more and so the cost of a whole enterprise of making a video game suddenly jumped in terms of financial investment and in terms of the financial risk. Um, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment and explain that with a, a much more dull side. Uh, and the third one is the business model and, uh, and this is the one uh, that I think takes a bit of explaining and, and so you know, here comes the science as they might say uh, in a bad uh, shampoo advert. Um, so this is, this is the business model that for many years Team 70 have worked with and um, it, was, it was kind of like the, the primary business model that, that most uh, game developers work with. It's called third party publishing and so you know, whenever you bought a game by uh, let's say THQ or Codemasters or um, oh, I'm trying to think of publishers now. Your mind's gone blank. Sony, Microsoft. Yeah, well not Sony, Microsoft because that's first party. Uh, but third party publishers, um, you know, generally what will happen is this is how it works. You, you have an idea for a game, um, and because the PlayStation and, and consoles thereafter, because of the cost of making games is so high, generally what you, what you need is you need somebody to invest in that game so that you can make it. They need to pay you, pay you the money so that you can afford to make it. Um, and so that person is a, is a publisher, or that group of people is a publisher, and so it's a bit like being an author of a book. You, know, you write a book, how's that book going to get to, to shelves? You know, how's it, who's going to make the book? Who's going to print it, reproduce it, get all of those books you know, in lorries, taken to shops? You know, who's going to do all of the marketing and organise all of the book signings and maybe even pulp that book when it gives me, you know? And uh, we're best known for uh, the Worms games, um, but here I've got a, a slide that you can barely see because of the very bright conditions. Uh, so you might have to take my word that it contains lots of other games uh, that we've also made in lots of other genres. And uh, look, you know, we've done uh, Alien Breed there, a top-down shooter, and uh, Project X, a side-on shooter. Uh, there's Body Blows, a beat-em-up, and a Super Frog, a platformer, you know, F-17 challenge. So in the early days, uh, Team Sabine actually did things other than games as well, which, was, which must have been exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's talk about um, worms, uh, the early worm here. And uh, it was brought to uh, Team 17 as a, as a demo, which has been coded in Bits Basic. And I, I, I'm led to believe it was brought as a, it's, it's been done for a competition by a very clever, talented, and attractive young man called Andy Davidson. Um, and uh, he showed it around uh, at ECTS, uh, which is a, a trade show that uh, used to happen in London every year. And uh, we like to believe that really, we were kind of like, I think we were about the last stop on his tour of publishers of the time and uh, I don't think anybody else had wanted it and so, um, you know, maybe he was scraping the bottom of the barrel when, when he signed with Team 17. But we like to believe that we saw something in it, a little bit of X Factor that maybe those other larger publishers didn't see. Um, and clearly, you know, it's a, it's a game uh, a game mechanic that you've been seen elsewhere, but there's something very, very special about Worms and I think the fact that we're still selling Worms today, um, you know, is a, is a testament to that. Well done, Andy. <laughs> um, so what came next uh, after the initial demo? Well, you, you, you probably already know that, and the answer is um, lots of work. 